Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Davis. I'm a curator here at the Whitliff Collections. And it's really a delight to see you all here for this special event to celebrate three very talented Texas State faculty authors. And i um, like to say this is going to be somewhat unusual in that uh, each author will take a turn reading. So I just want to give you a sense of how we have things kind of set up for today. Um, uh, each, each author will do about a 15-minute reading, and we'll ask that you hold your questions until the end, and then we'll do a Q&A session. And at that point, uh, once we're done with that, we'll have a book signing here at this front table where the authors are seated right now. And if you haven't seen already, the University Bookstore uh, is selling books around the corner. And um, the other thing I need to say is to turn off your cell phones if you haven't already. And um, also, our final presenter will be doing a PowerPoint. So uh, at that time, it's going to take us just a couple of minutes to adjust the lighting and so forth. So just bear with us at that moment. And to begin here, um, I'm going to provide kind of a brief introduction for each writer, just to give you a little better sense of who they are. We will start with Rene LeBlanc, who worked, has worked at Texas State for many years starting with a job back in the prehistoric days at the J.C. <laughs> Kellum Building, back when the J.C. Kellum Building was the university library. The Woodliffe Collections was brand new. And in those days, the collection was on an open floor surrounded by a wire cage. Uh, have any of you been around long enough to remember the wire cage, anybody? Um, well, I'd like to take a moment just to point out that the, the founding curator and director of the Woodliffe Collections, Dick Holland, the man who hired Renee, at this university, so you can blame Dick. Dick is here today with his lovely wife, Cynthia. So Dick, it's so great to have you come back for this. Always good to have you come back. And Dick, thanks for hiring me too, by the way. So I appreciate that. Um, so um, that cage, you know, supposedly it was there to protect the books and the rare archives that we have. Um, some people got the idea that the Woodliffe Collections was something of a zoo and that Renee was the main attraction at the zoo. <laughs> and I think she went for years without ever having to buy a lunch because people would come and they would throw popcorn through the enclosure <laughs> at her. And so <laughs> it's all true, folks. Um, and Renee did uh, eventually manage to escape from Dick and the rest of us and uh, went on and earned her MFA in creative writing here at Texas State and uh, joined the English faculty. At that point, she also works half time at the Student Learning Assistance Center on the fourth floor here at the library, where she is a beloved employee, just as she is in the English department. And during all of this time, Renee has uh, continued writing and publishing her exquisitely crafted short stories. They've appeared in many journals, including the Alaska Quarterly Review, Green Mountains Review, Louisiana Literature, and the Timber Creek Review, among many other places. And many of Renee's best stories are gathered in the collection that she'll be reading from today, Where the Body Ends, for sale around the corner. Um, Renee's stories are gripping, sometimes painful, and yet always transcendent, just like Renee herself is transcendent. And those of you who know Renee know what I mean when I say that. Um, I'm really pleased to announce that the title story here, Where the Body Ends, has been recently nominated for a Pushcart Prize for short fiction. And uh, Renee lives in New Braunfels, where she's a neighbor of mine. We live just down the street from each other. She shares her home with her husband, Dr. Roger Jones, who's here today. Her children, Colin and Chloe, an assortment of dogs, I mean, I'm, so, I'm sorry, an assortment of cats, and two very fearsome pugs. Um, and occasionally, if you're very lucky, and you pass by Renee's house at just the right time, you'll see some spectacular yard art as well. So. Yeah. Keep that in mind. So it's a real pleasure for us to be able to welcome Renee back to the Whitliff Collections in high style to celebrate her new book. So, Renee. Renee, wait. Renee, wait. Renee, I'm going to introduce everybody. Then, yeah. I'm going to introduce, introduce everybody so I can get out of the way and then we'll just have fun at that point. Okay. So. I'm still in the you know, Zoom up here. Zoom stay. <laughs> yeah, she's very well trained. Thanks to Dick for that, too. Um, our second reader, Tomas Q. Marine, is also a graduate of Texas State. Tomas came here as an undergraduate in the 1990s and earned his BA in Spanish. Then he went on to earn a master's degree with the idea of getting a PhD in Spanish and Italian studies 
and was bitten by the writing bug. And thank God he did get bitten by that bug. Um, he came here to Texas State and earned his MFA in creative writing. And he's now on the faculty here where, where he teaches literature and writing. And although he's still quite young, Tomas is already making a major name for himself as an American poet. His poems have appeared in Slate, Three Penny Review, Boulevard, Poetry, New England Review, and Narrative. And it was Boulevard that in 2010 named him the winner of its Emerging Poets Contest. Tomas is co-editor with Marila Esperance of the anthology Coming Close, 40 essays on Philip Levine, just out. His translation of Pablo Neruda's book, The Heights of Machu Picchu, is forthcoming from Copper Canyon Press. And here's the best news of all, this book, Tomas's poetry collection, A Larger Country, also on sale around the corner. It was named the winner of the American Poetry Review's Honickman Prize for first book of poetry, a truly significant honor. And in researching Tomas a bit uh, for this introduction I wanted to do, I came across quite a bit of praise for him. And there was this one quote uh, in Muzzle Magazine. Have you seen that? It really seemed to really strike at the heart of his accomplishment. So I just want to read a little bit from this review. It says, one of the things I love about Tomas Marine's poems is his quality of attention, his concern with larger questions and happenings. Maureen has a roving, eager intellect, and his work is sophisticated without being solipsistic. This is evident in Maureen's careful rendering of detail in his eye towards his surroundings, and in the way he patiently guides a reader through a landscape. He demonstrates himself to be a devotee of empathy. It's a pleasure to read work that's so generous and so thoroughly humane. So we're very proud, too, to have Tomas here on the faculty at Texas State and also here today to read from his new book. So Tomas, welcome. And finally, we have our celestial sleuth, Dr. Donald W. Olson, a revered physics professor here at Texas State. I first came to know Don just a little bit uh, back when he was doing groundbreaking work on Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, the Spanish explorer who washed up along the Texas coast of 1528. Don was allowed access, thanks to Dick again, to our rare uh, 1555 edition of Cabeza de Vaca's book. Although, actually, Don was only allowed access to the book after he agreed to set aside that omnipresent can of Diet Coke he carried with him everywhere. <laughs> there we go. He switched to the bottles now, I see. Okay. And it was from that close examination of the book that Don led the effort to solve the mystery of Cabeza Vaca's route through Texas and Mexico. And this was a remarkable achievement. It was a stunning breakthrough in Cabeza Vaca scholarship that overturned really a century of false assumptions by Texas historians and has led, created a, real, a new understanding of, of where Cabeza Vaca was and who he was interacting with. And it's really illuminated our picture of Texas prehistory in many ways. So this stunning achievement in Texas history, you know, was just another day at the office for Dr. Olson. Um, he's made a career out of solving mysteries like this. And you can read about them in his new book, also on sale today, Celestial Sleuth using astronomy to solve mysteries in art, history, and literature. Don, uh, I should add, received his BS in physics at Michigan State University, his PhD in physics from the University of California at Berkeley. He's been teaching at Texas State since 1981. And while many of us have known for a long time what a great teacher Don is, we received some really special news last week that I want to mention here today. Some of you already know about this. The American Association of Physics Teachers announced that Don Olson is the 2014 recipient of the Klotzberg Memorial Lecture Award. This recognizes educators who have made notable and creative contributions in the teaching of physics. This is a significant and well-deserved honor for Don that brings honor to our university as well. And Don, we're just so happy that you could join us for this today. Thanks. So you can see we have three wonderful authors, and we're so excited to get started. Take it away, Renee. Sit. No, stand. up here at the microphone. Stand. Stand. Use the microphone. Stand. 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 A whole fact never hurt. <laughs> After having worked in the zoo, of course. Um, the story I'm going to read today is actually published in the Alaska Quarterly Review, 
and um, it's called Evangeline. Uh, and to kind of, oh, that's right. I'm shorter than Steve. <laughs> okay, I'm reading it from a, a story published in the Alaska Quarterly Review called Evangeline. Um, it's a, it's a, what I've done is just excerpt various portions, but to kind of get you up to speed about where it is and what it's about. Um, it's dealing with um, a young mother who's single uh, and who's recently been diagnosed with melanoma. Um, and knowing that she's moved from Louisiana, from Lake Charles area, to be in Central Texas around her family just in case, you know, for support should her daughter need them and should she need them. Uh, the first scene that I'll read is set in the office where she works as a vet tech, uh, and a man has just brought in a dog to surrender. Uh, Ryan, Rihanna takes the dog, learning later on that day that, well, you'll learn what she learned later on that day. So, so since it's easier to see with these things, I'll go on and use them. Uh, okay, Evangeline. When the man brought the strange shepherd into the vet clinic, I'd already told myself, no more dogs, because if the cancer showed again. Who would take care of one? Mother and dad and their gated community? My sister Ellen and her fiance Victor, who'd already agreed to raise my daughter with them in San Antonio's Tony Alamo Heights with its good, high property tax supported schools? My next CAT scan was a week away. I looked up, 10 to 12, on the clock. In a few more minutes, I would have been eating lunch at Arby's, safe. The dog's nails ticked across the floor. She was shaggy, white except for chocolate ears. My ex, Alan Ledoux, and I used to raise Aussies, and I'd learned pure white can signal deafness, <coughs> blindness. In one litter, three unmarked pups had snuffled toward their dam, heat their sole sense of her. In the vet's office, the dog healed at the man's calf, peered up at me. My marriage had made me susceptible. Three years of raising Lucy Bell, Stotter, Clotilde, Vanjie, and Uncle Bub. Then Alan took them away. The man said she needed a home. She'd wandered out of the woods behind his house. She can't be around my animals. Wouldn't be safe. For her, he said, proud. When he looked at me through stubby lashes, I thought, you're the one who needs a choke chain. I came around the counter. I had to. She's a good dog, he said. Sleeps at the foot of the bed, whimpers to go out. Someone's worked with her. Worked with her. He probably trained his women, too. No one's claimed her? I can't keep her. He said he'd pay for the flea dip, vaccinations. He wasn't dumping her. Good for you. I bent to stroke her head. One eye was blue. What about you, he said. She likes you. I straightened up. I don't think I can. I used to raise Australian shepherds. I used to run a boarding stable for horses. Quarter horses, thoroughbreds, race horses. But that was a long time ago. She's taken to you. She's shy. He narrowed his eyes like he was reading me. He raised his chin, directed his gaze at a stand of scientifically formulated dog food. And me, wild, foolhardy, I caved. I'll take care of her. What's her name? Malinche, Evangeline, your choice, he laughed, since she's chosen you. Maybe she senses a kindred spirit. He looked me over, led him. I straightened, projected my own aggressive aura. Should I growl? Then he smiled. His small teeth shockingly light in his dusky face. Here's my card if you have any problems, he said. I bared my teeth, sunny and threatening. I won't. His business card, a clump of blue cedars on its right corner and centered beneath him in blue script. Wes Bailey, electrician and poet. Your toughest wiring jobs are that difficult letter. Special invitations and announcement, whatever it takes to jumpstart the heart. Below this in a smaller script, an address and phone number. A poet electrician, that sounded improbable. An Irish was the last thing I would have pegged him. Too dark, too broad in the nose, mulatto, Creole, Hispanic, genetically inscrutable. I put the card in my purse. I was a bad guesser. When Dr. Flaggart moved the spot, I didn't worry because of auspicious omens. We'd moved to Central Texas because the vet I'd gotten a job from was the only one I'd heard of who offered benefits. My daughter I made begun kindergarten and loved it. I'd gotten a raise. My old lover, not Alan, he'd been gone years, was still around. But the results came back melanoma. I felt my intuition ball up, bristle. Now, a year later, the day of the dog. Douglas, the vet tech, told me Evangeline was pregnant. And I laughed. A sound tinny like toy monkey cymbals. Evangeline, 
that fit. She's Louisiana's mythical Cajun girl, waiting forever for an unfaithful sweetheart. My dog, knocked up, cast out. You going to be all right, Douglas? The other vet tech's white brows pinched. She's the one with the morning sickness, I said. I'll take a hep puppy if that'll help. Be careful, I told him. Dr. Teachin, our vet, came up. I'm going to need help with this parrot, she said. And so from that point, um, she learns that you know she's taking the dog and she really needs to tell her daughter. And when she takes the dog home, uh, and picks up her daughter on May from school. She tells her, you know, we've adopted another dog. Please don't tell grandmother, or grandfather, um, aunt, your aunt or your uncle. And though she knows eventually she's going to have to reveal where the dog came from and, and the fact that she has the dog. Um, and so at that point, I'll read you a very small section from her story. Um, it's when she's put her daughter down for the night and she's thinking about her earlier relationship with her husband, Alan. And she's curious, it just made her think because her daughter asked what would the babies look like. And, you know, and she, she just, it made her think. Maybe, I answered, it was an Australian shepherd. She looked at me. She'd never seen her own daddy, never asked to see photographs. She'd never seen him. He'd left before she was born. A good thing, I always thought. If he'd seen her, he might have taken her too. As it was, he didn't write or call, even though he knew she existed. A combed of strand out of Ame's lashes. Once she was down for the night, I took a beer and went outside. I drink when sleep seems distant. Stars pricked the sky. Back in Lake Charles, the refinery's red glow had suffused even the night sky. Only directly above you, beyond the tips of the blackest pines, could you see stars, and sometimes the moon, bleary. Night was dense. The silence blanketed with the shuffles and snorts of horses, the dog whimpers and false alarm barks extending into tremulous howls. The peacocks would peel tubes of sound, thoughtlessly mournful. Occasionally, Alan joined in, beating on the wall with a worn sneaker, or opening the window and shouting, shut the fuck up. He hated to be wakened. <coughs> One night, I caught him in the paddock with a hose, trying to douse the roosting peacocks. That bastard, Ellen said, when I told her he'd let me, Ellen was my sister. I was shocked. Ellen rarely cursed. He knew you were pregnant. So she goes on to consider her husband and why he left and left her when she was pregnant before he'd even seen his child. What Alan Ledoux, her husband, never understood, she said, was flum what flummoxed him was that I loved him, only him. Once I convinced him that the golf pro and the veterinarian had never interested me, he latched on to the 70-year-old neighbor as the man who was competing for my affection. One day, Alan came home to find me helping Mr. DeWitt tranquilize a peacock and said, found another one? Mr. DeWitt thought he was talking about the peacock. I excused myself, taking an Alan aside. Is this a Cajun thing, I said, jealousy? No, it's your long legs. You don't keep cover. His words took on a post-track, post-six-plaque blur. It's the way you look back. He licked his lips like he was thinking of me with other men. You are a coon ass, I'd shouted, half amused. He was only angry, I'd thought, but it was the beginning of the end. And so at this point, after thinking of her husband, uh, she goes back to pick up her, her daughter. She goes back to work, sorry. And when she gets there, she tries to call Wes Bailey because she's wondering who indeed the father of these puppies are. And on, when she tries to try to call, she found out the electrician poet's his phone is disconnected. Douglas, the other vet tech, lets her know what he's learned about Wes when she comes back from lunch, that Wes Bailey has a kind of shady history, possibly connected to Huntsville State Prison. And worst and scariest to Rihanna, he raises wolf hybrids. Um, she fears, of course, that Evangeline's puppies will be part wolf and that they won't be safe to be around her daughter. And so she decides she has to find out where this man lives. She has to see this dog and talk to him, his dogs, and see if one of them is the father of Evangeline's puppies. So she prints out a map with his address and then Saturday drives out to see him with her daughter on the way to run an errand to get a lead for her dog, Evangeline, because she's already shown a tendency to escape and run off. Um, when she gets close to what she thinks is his house, she sees him coming out of the house and walking toward her as she's driving. And she's suddenly taken by a fit of panic and 
and takes off because she's got her daughter with her and the whole idea of dealing with him then is, 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 um, creates great fear in her. Um, so she, she puts off going to see him until Wednesday after her appointment, the next appointment with her oncologist. And at the oncologist, she learns she does the melanoma, the spot as she calls it is spread, leaving three dots under her arm. Um, upset and fearful, she drives home and she swings by the trailer on the way to check on the dog before picking up her daughter from school. And at the trailer, um, she finds Evangeline and her lead and fears that West Bailey has come and taken her because the lead is gone too. The dog hasn't broken away. So at that point, she's beginning to panic. She rushes to pick up her daughter from school, gets there, and learns from the children watching that her daughter is driven off with a man in a car, basically, uh, that she's been picked up. So really afraid at this point, she drives to West Bailey's house again, fearful that he might have taken her daughter, or that her ex, perhaps, has returned and claimed her. At this point, she's just driven by fear. Um, and this is the last section of the story, when she arrives finally at West Bailey's house. A white van was parked in front of Bailey's house. When I got out, I heard yapping, nervous and excited, Evangeline. She was tied to a lone pecan, a thump in my chest like a big bird, shot and flopping. I ran toward the house. Bailey opened the door. He said, you didn't get my note at your trailer? I called him at the office. Where's my daughter, I said. He stepped back. I took the dog, not your daughter. Prove it. He stepped aside. Something about him, the white tee stretched across his chest, the way his head tilted back, his eyes half closed. I was taller than him, but I felt as though he were watching me from above, like one of those statues guarding an Egyptian tomb. Be my guest, he said. White walls empty except for a worn painting of a cabin subsumed by snow, the dull softness of carpet, a couch, a television with a dusty screen, Every room was sparse, provisional, a mattress draped with sheets, a bathroom without curtains or towels, one roll of toilet paper on the tub. In the back bedroom, which held a desk and a baseball-shaped pencil holder, I looked out at the green yard, the oaks blocking the river. Chalky dust got on my fingers when I touched the windowsill. A wolf dog trotted under the window and looked up panting. It whined, then wheeled and departed. A moment later, I heard scratching at what must have been the back door. I went toward the sound. Bailey was watching me from the front room. Let him in, he won't bite. The back door is open, a scream between me and the wolf dog. Was it Alan then? Had he come back for Ame? I felt a rush of hope at the thought, ridiculous considering he might have kidnapped her. Still, the feeling was there, a sense of potential reprieve. When I was eight or nine months pregnant, the ringing phone used to trigger a surge in me like it might be, Alan. I'm coming back, it's time. But right now, just the wolf dog looked up at me, mouth drawn high at the corners. Alan wasn't coming ever. The dots under my arm weren't going away. I felt a numb sinking, then a soggy buoying toward the surface and a gasp of air, not hope exactly. Victor, I thought. Had mother told Ellen and Victor, my sister and her husband, to pick up Ame? Was Victor the man in the car? I felt disengaged from my body, remote controlled, I opened the screen door. One wolf dog brushed past then another. They went to Bailey. I need to use your phone, I said, turning toward him robotic. Feel free. He gestured toward the kitchen. It was empty and dusty too. A calendar open to February hung over the phone. While I dialed, West Bailey put two beers on the kitchen table. He opened one for me. One of the wolf dogs stretched on the floor beside him. Another sat underneath the table. Mother answered on the first ring. How was it, she asked. I heard Dad on another line say, Honey, do you know where Ame is? Silence, then Dad stern. Mother. They were going to your city park, Mother said, since you wouldn't let them have her for the whole day. You should have told me, I said. Part of me sunk. Someday they'd likely have her for good, my sister and her husband. There was nothing I could do. Rihanna, she sounded suspicious. Her turn to worry, I hung up. Bailey got up and slid the beer over. I took it and drank. Why did you take my dog, I said. He went to the fridge. That nerd at the vet's office told me she was pregnant and you didn't want the puppies. When and how did you know where I live? I used the phone book. I bought a map. That the puppies are Thor's, they're valuable. He pushed another beer in my direction. Is that Thor, I said, opening the beer and nodding at the wolf dog next to him? The father, yes. I need her back. My daughter is counting on her. We need Evangeline. 
For a second, I wished for, for Douglas's sunglasses to hide behind. Bailey peered through his lashes. I'm not leaving without my dog, I added. Bailey leaned back in his chair. I want to split the litter. That or you pay stud fee, if the puppies are mine. Yours? I raised my eyebrows. You know what I mean. I took a sip of my beer. I was going to write you a note. I don't believe in hybrids. His teeth glinted. What's wrong with them? They're strong, stronger than their parents. I thought of Alan and myself, of Ame, half Cajun. I hope you're right. Of course, we don't know the puppies are hybrids, I added, very warmth spreading through me. They might be half Dotson. An inventive father, that, he looked at me, because she's tall, I mean. And it hit me, not with the dots, me with the dots sliding down the steep road to cancer. This bad poet and possible felon, author of electricity and Spartan housekeeper, might be making a pass. That or I was flattering myself. I have to go. I moved toward the door, opened it. Evangeline strained toward me on her lead. Then Bailey was behind me, his words palpable, warm on my shoulder, my neck. You don't have to do anything, he said. His hand brushed my elbow, the small of my back. I didn't have to do anything but turn, place my face and mouth near his. Not anything, I thought, as his tongue, beer sweet and feral, came inside. Did he know I was sick, terminal, a bad risk? I'd take the chemo, think the good thoughts, but really it was up to someone in a white lab coat to save my life now. Evangeline started barking again, staccato, high-pitched. I'm sorry. I closed my eyes and let him pull me toward the buzzing, the blackness I could see, toward why not anything. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, first, I would first like to start by um, thanking Steve Davis and uh, the wonderful folks at the Whitliff for making this all happen. It's um, it's really a pleasure to share the afternoon with uh, Renee and Don and, and and all of you. Dumb luck. There's some things I should tell you beforehand. I was born on a bed covered quickly with a quilt. I stepped my bare feet into the new world of a lamplit room in the country. Because of a broken drive shaft we stayed, my mother and I, among the witch hazel straddled houses and the buzzard heavy poles rising upward like wooden angels. She had meant to rest on the bleached linens of the Sisters of Mercy Hospital. If only I had not come early, I might have been named Olaf or Sven after one of the three doctors in town. Why does any of this matter, you wonder? What is the point of unwinding the threads of this life I will never have? My mother wanted a daughter, so at five I dressed flowers with my hair and answered to Margaret as she watched my face darken with all the coming furies of boyhood. If they had conceived me sooner, I might now remember my father taking his streaked hand to my back and lifting me into the stunned air of April. Although common sense suggests I wouldn't have remembered the moment, nor his face, or the light rain tapping, its fingers on our shingled roof like a deaf man pounding Chopin away on the keys of an unstringed piano because he believes what he was told, that there is joy in our sheer movement of a thing from A to B that a sound made realizes its purpose when it fills a silence, because that is what we do when we are born. We waken and cry to the silent walls and a radio gone hush, to the earthbound rooster and hens bent in the yard, because we are finally in the world we always said we wanted. A model for the priesthood. In thigh deep water, we lashed the air with our rods and re-examined the eternal questions. Tongue, eye, nose. Which one has the shortest route to the brain? The heart. 
Which nails would you release first if it were given to you, the feet or the hands? If Chickamauga meant river of the dead, then what were the implications for all bodies of water? He filled the sink with the trout who hit our lines, crossed himself once, twice, then renamed and cut each one, their vague eyes rolling, while I made ready to gently knuckle each flayed beloved with garlic and thyme, an American John to his American Jesus. Humming my crazy songs over the black faces of the pans, I baptized in butter. The dead will only suffer butter, he liked to say, as I dropped a shoulder and tumbled each head into a basket for the tabby in the woods who never failed to pick up the scent of resurrection in our mouths, who would chirp and follow us even unto the shaky outhouses where we rocked and returned the dead to the earth from where they came. A few years back, a few years back, um, I volunteered for uh, Mobile Loaves and Fishes. Those of you from the Central Texas area uh, are familiar with it, and um, they had this side program whereby um, uh, you could boil uh, a dozen or two dozens worth of eggs at home, and then take them and drop them off at their center. And one day, when I was uh, doing this, I was doing the drop off. I noticed that there was um, this sign that said Egg Ministry. And uh, the first thought, of course, uh, that came to my mind was um, what a religion for chickens would look like. <laughs> and the next question was what a minister in that religion would do, which is um, sort of the genesis of this poem, Egg Ministry. In a grim hen house, I find the faithful clucking about the rapture. And whether heaven is truly shallow and fresh like a box of straw waiting for birth. All eggs will break, I assure them, the laws of gravity, and rise from china bowl and carton alike, from the unswept thresholds of batteries, up past fire escape and silo, cloud and bird. As they consider this, a reddish bouquet crested hen nods to sleep and glides to jumbled scenes of desert sand and sticky Egyptian hands grinding a bold yolk yellow powder for mixing with egg and water to paint skin, no doubt. Later, Giotto will use it to ignite his poor saint's heads, while Botticelli will mute it for his Madonnas whose petite, exhausted faces in the flight-heavy dreams of hens would surely flake, and having flaked, leaf into the moist air to spin and reweave a lost tribe of yokes before shocked eyes if the halls were not empty, the museum goers not banished to go sit somewhere on their children as good parents should. Such is the dream life of hens. To the doubters who jeer and stare, call me misguided, I say, there are too many of us to save. The battle over our souls was decided long ago anyway. So why not preach to the bookless chicken? When they sneer, I tell them, if your God is great enough, lower your nose to an overdue clutch and thread through the 17,000 pores of each shell the odor of patience gone sour, sulfurous. And once it has coursed through your heart, sat in your stomach, and you can no longer carry the burden, return what you have taken to the dirt, which will gladly welcome your offering even as you wipe your mouth on your sleeve and cringe at the chicks sprinting from the shadow of the car you left parked under the sign, Eggs for Sale, because you are now a part of the ritual, a necessary antagonist to a faith no less fragile than your own. This next poem is uh, titled Laika, and Laika is the name of a, a Russian dog that has the distinction of being uh, the first species from Earth to ever enter into space. So this poem is for Laika. In 57, Sputnik II carried her into space where the first bark went unheard. Did she lick herself or nip at the whir of the fan in that cabin? These concerns were not important to science, unlike velocity, heart rate, time of death. When my faith in justice wavers, I embrace my inner Greek and butcher the sky, carve out a swath of stars catching a curve of light millions of years old and pretend it's the outline of a dog, 
half husky, half terrier. I retreat to this fantasia when another report of animal cruelty soils further the already filthy news. It was years before we knew she didn't last more than five hours in that wretched kennel, weightless. And think of the trash she could have rooted, the black boots she could have shined with the few well-placed curtsies in deference to the great mutts of history. Think Khrushchev and Kennedy. Sweet Laika, it has been decades since my last confession, and my sins are many. In Kathmandu, I herded strays through the alleys, ticked their foreheads and paws red, wept in gratitude when they licked my face, because now they might let me pass through the gates of heaven with only a tender snarl for having diced garlic. May the bulbs forgive me in the kitchens of Laos. I went my whole life without seeing a dog struck by a car, and then it was there. Have mercy upon the pronoun. I didn't get out. In the mirror, watching the Chevys and Fords, pounding the pavement with its tail before the truck hauling from Georgia, who knows what, it was in that other Georgia, the colder one, where I entered the life of a minor scientist, hunting the bakeries of Moscow for tea cake one day, the trash heaps the next, for any dog the size of a bread box, one not much bigger than the tabby at the foot of my bed dreaming about the injustice of wings, unaware of my past allegiances, that I was born under the sign of the dog, that I have lived and died a traitor to my own kind. In um, 2007, a, uh, the British artist Jonathan Yao um, made a very unique portrait of um, then President George W. Bush. And this portrait was a, um, it's a collage. Uh, what he did was he took these um, um, adult magazines and uh, he clipped the pictures into various shapes and jigsawed together this um, very pornographic portrait of George W. Bush. Um, what I didn't know when I first saw this uh, portrait online was um, that in the weeks that would follow, I would be um, uh, sort of haunted by this giant pornographic uh, head of George W. Bush that would just seem to follow me around. Uh, and my, this poem was a sort of way to exercise um, our former president. Presidential Portrait. Upon first seeing the shadow box collage of the 43rd president, I thought his face is a kaleidoscope of bodies. Later that night, I stared at my own face in the window, bent, fluid, like a dying animal's. In the morning, I started an ode to the artist who cut out the women he found in magazines, like coupons, in order to fashion Bush's face. I wanted to applaud the cheap irony, but kept returning to the blameless curve of an arm, or the idea, rather, of that arm, and of tapered fingers a father would have cradled while crossing the street, or the wet feet of someone's daughter hopping in her galoshes over piles and piles of yesterday's snow now turned the color of traffic. I couldn't escape. Even when I slept, he was there. When I woke, I told him, enough already, sincerity is dead. But he only smiled and seemed about to stumble into a speech on the mutilated millennium or how nations could beautify their hinterlands the American way, a dollar at a time. Starved for affection, he follows me everywhere like a puppy. At church, he tears the bread and laps the wine because he'll believe in anything once. Whenever we enter a grocery store, mothers will cover their children's eyes because I was all wrong, you see, about the fingers and the arms and the feet, even the blame, most of all the blame. Because the portrait I saw was a fog, a bank of pixels teased to within a blot of themselves so that I couldn't see the array of vulvas, each carefully trimmed anus jigsawed into a patch of pubic hair to make the sweep of his coy lips, which are now in the shower with me crooning, love me daddy blues and his best Bessie Smith. After I've toweled and shaved, slipped into my best suit a la Keats, I'll sit at my desk, cloaked in a fabric so prehistoric It'll be hard to tell what is more monstrous, the proud head wobbling on the couch or the party-colored clown lost over a blank page for what seems like years, searching its deep white for a pattern, 
a single sentence to drape over the monsters of the world. Now I have just a couple more. On the Lamb. Tonight I sit alone with the wall, staring at its poster of poached eggs with yellow tights, a piece of bacon for a hat, announcing the return to prominence of breakfast when everyone secretly knows lunch is more deserving. This kind of absurdity is what keeps me awake at night, tiptoeing in my socks to relatch the windows, to test the locks on the door for the hundredth time, while the couple upstairs sleeps in plein air. The wind off the harbor thwacking their curtains, a quilt laid over their bodies like a wing. She dreams of the fabulous men she has never met, the ones who will take direction around a body, who will not drag pleasure home by the hair, clubbing the red dahlias along the way, sparing all the others. In her heaven she is chasing true love, not the man who is cradling her head in his arm, is now adjusting his hips, is now dreaming of an Appaloosa from Lascaux. Tomorrow, she will make the perfect pot of coffee and walk to the corner where she will meet the man of her dreams mailing his bills a week early, while the angel from her bed drives into the country to buy a bay mare. Such is life in utopia. I'm on the run from this murderous peace, hiding in a basement from the police of good intentions who want to question me about my crooked teeth, my ugly hands, the mohair jacket I lifted from someone's chair, its elbows thin, its gilded buttons rotten. At daybreak, I'll carefully slip in among the slacks and skirts, marching to work. But before I go, before I follow my nose down to the wharf, before I set sail for better shores, where the children run the docks, hawking scarves and zinnias for the jingle in your pocket, where their parents still know how to fight, and what's better, how to lose themselves in anger, reluctant anger, the kind we were granted long ago on the eighth day, when he was no longer busy hiding justice in the fang of each beast, remorse in the shaft of each claw. And all that lives in my teeth is regret, sweet regret, pacing its network of black caves at all hours of the morning, debating the virtues of cobbler and hunger, the ethics of pity, if one could make a philosophy out of departures. Before I leave for good, I'll gently turn out my pockets and gather the crumbs into a pile for the mice in the wall, wipe the filth from their eyes one last time, perform one more devotion before I turn my back on this earnest paradise. Some years ago, I read this uh, poem called um, The Body Sniffers by Sharon Olds. Um, and if you don't know her work, I, I highly recommend it. And she's terrific. And in this poem, The Body Sniffers, um, what she imagined was that in this reality, um, human beings had been trained to perform the same um, a task that cadaver dogs do. And um, the first thought that crossed my mind was, well, um, so what happens, to, what happens to the dogs that are already trained to do this? You know, it's, it's a tough economy, you know, tough job market. Um, they have all these skills. They can't use them anymore. They've been replaced by us. Um, so yeah, as you can tell, um, silly questions is often where my poems come from. Bloodhounds. Once they had been replaced by people with noses equally capable of navigating a complex sea of collapsed rebar and concrete to a single drifting mode of skin, they sought other employment. The truth was clear. We didn't need walking, shamefully at times, to a dry median during rush hour, nor training to say, here, dig here, this one can make it. Out of work, some hung up their fedoras, put away the spyglass, and went to the country to herd, but discovered sheep stink, goats too, and that horses can't be trusted. In the city, others tried guarding banks, but were too often lulled to sleep by the dull odor of husbands and wives. Soon, the newspapers began to cry what dogs could already hear, mongrels, lazy, take our jobs is what they do. Slowly, many drifted back to the swamps of long rifles, 
of coons piled on a porch, a hum with the 19th century. Years later, when hardly anyone remembered them, a lone pack did what celebrities do when they fall from favor. They answered the call of Hollywood to join the cameras and props on the set of the new singing school. That first night, we watched them warm up by howling the vowels. Over and over, the long O drew from the black and tan chorus a wail from the old world, a helpless moan that broke the backs of centuries each time it passed through the sad, bent halo of their mouths. They were a hit because karaoke was fashionable again, as was suffering, as was pity. And so the episodes kept coming, cabled week after week into the dark living rooms where our beautiful, intelligent race sat in the raw hours, attentive, sniffing the air, waiting for a sign in those throaty baritones that we might yet find another life. Thank you. <laughs>